Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining this World Bank live event on the cost and affordability of healthy diets. My name is William Masters. I have the privilege of directing the Food Prices for Nutrition Project. Uh, and we have a truly extraordinary group of people assembled for this event today. We're live in English with interpretation in French. And for everyone, please do share your thoughts and, and submit your questions in the chat box. Your questions will enter a queue, will be answered either by our experts within the chat box or by panelists during the Q&A. You can also join the conversation on social media using the hashtag food prices for nutrition. And today's event is being recorded and the video will be online to this site so you can, can link to that. For further discussion, we hope you can also join us tomorrow, the same time for a policy symposium hosted by IFPRI. Links to that event are at the new Food Prices for Nutrition data hub that's up right now on the main data.worldbank.org site. Today, the conversation is to introduce this new data hub to discuss the remarkable opportunities for policy analysis and guidance that it opens up by what we're learning about the cost and affordability of healthy diets around the world. As you know, last week, the United Nations announced headline results for each country's total cost per day and the total population that currently cannot afford a healthy diet. That was produced for the FAO as part of the FAO, IFAD, UNICEF, WFP, WHO flagship annual report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world. In today's discussion, we get to look behind that headline result and look ahead to their implications for the world food system. We have an extraordinary panel, global and national leaders to discuss how these diet costs and affordability data can be used to guide policies and programs. So we'll hear first from our hosts at the World Bank with opening remarks from Art Cray, the acting senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank Group. Art is a distinguished economist, superbly placed to put this work into its global context. Art, over to you, thank you. Thanks very much, Will. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's uh, particularly my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this event, uh, which really couldn't take place at a more opportune, opportune time. Um, you know, as we know from the headlines, the world is facing a global food security crisis of alarming proportions. Record high food prices have triggered a global crisis that threatens to expand extreme poverty by millions, worsen hunger and malnutrition, and further stretch already very stretched government resources. I wish I could say that the outlook looks optimistic, but unfortunately it does not. Between COVID-19 supply chain disruptions, drought and crop losses, more recently the adverse impact of the war in Ukraine on crop and fertilizer prices, all of which are combining towards higher food prices, which are only likely to, um, to exacerbate the current situation. The current crisis highlights the need for crucial reforms to increase the efficiency and resilience of food systems around the world particularly low and middle income countries, so that they can actually have the systems and the goods and the markets in place to deliver better nutritional outcomes for everyone and particularly for the most vulnerable. The crisis is affecting many of the bank's client countries disproportionately, and the bank is taking urgent steps to address food insecurity, both through its lending operations and its analytical work. This includes making up to 30 billion in lending available over the next 15 months in existing and new projects to encourage food and fertilizer production, enhance food systems, facilitate trade, and support vulnerable households and producers. These efforts um, on the policy and lending front are complemented by the bank's deep analytical work in this area. As I'm sure many of you are aware, the bank closely monitors commodity prices and provides market analysis for commodity groups, including major agricultural and food items, um, as well as fertilizer and energy. Um, the bank has an active program of work, which I myself have had the privilege of contributing to in a small way um, on studying statistical forecasting models that are designed to predict the outbreak of food crises for timely preventive actions. Uh, the bank has also been conducting high frequency phone surveys, uh, which were deployed during COVID and have been extremely valuable tools for assessing food security and insecurity status in real time. Um, and then most importantly, the reason that we're gathered today is to talk more about um, what, what has been done in the past several years to leverage the rich and unique global data on retail food prices from the International Comparison Program uh, with the Secretary of which sits with the World Bank. Um, in collaboration with our colleagues in Tufts University, IFPRI and FAO, the Food Prices for Nutrition Project is generating new indicators measuring the cost and affordability of a healthy diet around the world. 
Um, through this project, which we're here to learn more about today, we hope to equip governments and development agencies with data that they can use to monitor this key um, in, uh, this key indicator of diet cost affordability in order to inform agriculture and food systems interventions. The findings from this work, which my colleague Nada Hamada will be presenting momentarily, are striking, and they challenge us not only to greater policy efforts to address food insecurity, but also to think more deeply about more fundamental questions. It is striking, for example, that the cost of a healthy diet is estimated to be over 50% higher than the bank's extreme poverty line, which in turn is based on the national poverty lines adopted by low-income countries. The fact that a person can be considered not poor according to these poverty lines, and yet be far from able to afford a healthy diet, let alone other essentials, should give us pause. It should also make us consider more deeply both what these extreme poverty lines mean, as well as to continue our efforts to think very um, hard about the difficult technical issues at the boundaries of nutrition, science, and development economics that need to be addressed when coming up with um, high quality, robust uh, measures of the cost of a healthy diet. I'd like to take this opportunity to, you know, just formally acknowledge and thank all our partners who are involved in this project, particularly our colleagues at Tufts, IFPRI, the FAO, as well as the Gates Foundation and the uh, United Kingdom uh, FCDO for their generous funding. We are all here today because our ambitions go beyond merely the eradication of hunger. People around the world need to be able to afford nutritious diets in order to live healthier lives. With that, let me turn things over to, well, either our moderator or to Nana, whoever goes next. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Art, for that framing. Super helpful. And we now, as he mentioned, Art just mentioned, we get to hear directly from Nada Hamadeh about the Food Prices for Nutrition Data Hub. Nada is manager in the development data group. She leads this work in the World Bank, and she also manages the very large international comparison program that Art just mentioned, from which the underlying item prices are drawn. It's been a real delight to work with her, the entire World Bank Development Data Group, on this project, uh, which Nada will now explain. Thank you so much, Will. Uh, I will indeed take the audience now through a presentation on the Food Prices for Nutrition Project, its methods, and the indicator that it produces. The UN released last week its 2022 report of the state of food security and nutrition in the world, we refer to as SOFI. The report paints a sobering picture. Almost 3.1 billion people could not afford a healthy diet in 2020. That is 112 million more people than in 2019, and 42% of the global population. And nearly three quarters of people affected live in lower middle income countries with another 15% in low income and 12% in upper middle income countries, while just half a percent of the global population unable to afford a healthy diet live in a high income country. Sophie highlighted changes in affordability between 2017 to 2020 and alerted readers to the uptick between 2019 and 2020 in both the number of people unable to afford a healthy diet and the share of the global population affected, reversing the previous downward trend. The uptick was seen across all income groups, but of course, those living in low and lower middle income countries remain at most risk of being unable to afford a healthy diet at around 90% and 70% of their populations respectively. Of course, affordability depends on two factors the cost of a healthy diet, and the household disposable income available to spend on food. In 2017, the global average cost of a healthy diet was $3.31, while in 2020, it was $3.54, based on current purchasing power parities for each year. The highest cost was seen in upper middle income countries at $3.76 in 2020, and lower middle income countries experienced the highest growth in the cost, 8.9% from 2017 to 2020. I will take you on a deep dive of the Food Prices for Nutrition project and the research on cost and affordability of a healthy diet that underlie the results reported in the SOFI. The Food Prices for Nutrition project is a partnership between Tufts University, 
the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, and the World Bank in close collaboration with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. This project is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and UK Aid through the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office of the United Kingdom. Food Prices for Nutrition was set up to provide food price measurement to help match the aspiration of attaining food security as defined by the World Food Summit in 1996. Food security is when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to meet dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. The focus of Food Prices for Nutrition is to measure economic access through diet cost and affordability. The objective of the Food Prices for Nutrition project is to provide indicators on the cost and affordability of healthy diets to inform action to address food insecurity around the world. The indicators provide a tool to help guide food systems and agriculture interventions and monitor progress towards a global food system that brings healthy diets within reach of all people at all times. Food prices create a ladder of diet affordability. First, an energy sufficient diet. This is the cheapest and most affordable of these diets. It provides enough calories from starchy stable foods for a person needing 2,330 calories per day. It's the first step on this ladder of affordability where food prices dictate the economic access to a diet. Second on a ladder is a nutrient adequate diet. It's more costly than an energy sufficient diet. It avoids nutrient deficiency or excess through providing a variety of foods. However, a nutrient adequate diet does not have other attributes needed for long-term health as specified in national food-based dietary guidelines. On the third step is the healthy diet. It is based on food group recommendations by national food-based dietary guidelines and is the preferred indicator for measuring access and affordability. A healthy diet meets requirements for food-based dietary guidelines, provide foods in sufficient quantities for an active and healthy life, meets energy and nutrient needs for a representative adult, protects against diet-related diseases, and is dignified and culturally appropriate. How do we build a healthy diet basket? It's a global standard set of criteria that represents commonalities across most national food-based dietary guidelines created for the purpose of calculating and comparing the cost and affordability of healthy diets across countries. Six food groups make up the basket. Starchy staples contribute around half the calories for the basket. Three groups, oils and fats, animal source foods, and legumes, nuts, and seeds each contribute around 13% of calories. Fruits contribute 7% of calories. Vegetables contribute around 5% of calories. A least cost healthy diet used by Food Prices for Nutrition uses the least expensive locally available foods at each time and place to fulfill each food group contribution to the healthy diet basket. There are 11 food items selected in each country to make up the basket covering the six food groups. As I mentioned earlier, the global average cost of a least cost healthy diet in 2020 was $3.54. Here you can see the average relative cost of each food group that form part of the total diet. The cost shares of animal source foods and vegetables each account for around 25% of the total cost and fruits 20%. The cost shares of starchy staples and legumes, nuts, and seeds in the basket are lower, around 15% and 11% respectively, with oils and fats typically accounting for around just 4%. Of course, these are global averages and relative costs are different in each country. For example, the cost shares of the healthy diet basket for Senegal, Pakistan, and Italy are shown here. In Senegal, vegetables are the biggest cost share of the basket at 31%. In Pakistan, animal source foods are the largest at 30%. In Italy, fruits in the basket are the most costly at 28% of the total. Regarding the smaller shares, oils and fats have a cost share of just 2% in Italy, 
while that food group accounts for 6% and 9% of the total cost in Pakistan and Senegal, respectively. And of course, as the basket is based on locally available foods, the items in the healthy diet basket in one country will look different to that in another country. For example, in Senegal, sartines form part of the animal source group, while in Pakistan and Italy, chicken and milk are included. Dates and mangoes are chosen for the foods group in Senegal, while bananas and coconuts are the fruit inputs in Pakistan, and Italy has apples and bananas. Onions and carrots feature in the vegetable food group of all three countries. Where do these prices of the items in the six food groups come from? The International Comparison Program, or ICP for short, is one of the world's largest statistical programs. It's a global partnership of national, regional, and multilateral agencies with the ICP Global Office hosted at the World Bank. Through its surveys, the ICP collects the prices of goods and services that make up total GDP in each of its 170 plus participating countries and compiles national account expenditures data for each economy as well. As part of the survey process, a part of the survey process is collecting prices of representative food items that are typically consumed by household in each country. These items reflect what the consumer can access and their prices reflect what the consumer actually pays at the point of sale. Food Prices for Nutrition uses this granular data to identify the items in each country which are suitable for the healthy diet basket and are least expensive. These prices are collected in local currency units but are converted to a common currency using the purchasing power parities calculated by the ICP. This enables cross-country comparisons of the cost of a healthy diet and the food groups within that basket. So now we have the prices to establish the cost of a healthy diet, but how do we measure the affordability of or economic access to a healthy diet? We compare the cost relative to income and food expenditures. The ICP database provides food expenditure data and the World Bank Poverty and Inequality Platform provides income distribution data. Food prices for nutrition then estimates what proportion of household income is spent on food. In low-income countries, expenditure data compiled by the ICP show that people spend, on average, 52% of expenditures on food. We use this to measure whether the cost of a healthy diet is below or above 52% of income i.e. to assess whether the healthy diet is affordable. The cost indicators av available through the new Food Prices for Nutrition Data Hub are cost of a healthy diet per person per day, cost of both an energy sufficient and a nutrient adequate diet per person per day, cost per person per day, the cost share, and the cost relative to starchy staples of the different food groups we highlighted earlier. The affordability indicators of, uh, available through the new data hub are share of the population and number of people who cannot afford each diet cost, ratio of each diet cost to average food expenditures, ratio of each diet cost to 52% of the international poverty line. Together, these indicators provide the opportunity to analyze differences across countries, regions, and income groups. For example, this chart shows the cost of a healthy diet in each country and the share of the population and number of people unable to afford the diet. And this chart shows the cost of each of the six food groups relative to the cost of the starchy staples food group in a healthy diet in each country. These results are a small snapshot of what's available on the new Food Prices for Nutrition Data Hub. The Data Hub provides access to and information on the data and indicators from the Food Prices for Nutrition project and which underlie the cost and affordability results reported in the SOFI report. It includes 33 indicators for more than 170 countries as well as regions and income groups. And there is a full data set for the year 2017 selected indicators for 2018 to 2020. It provides users with interactive charts and maps to further explore the data. We will continue to update the data hub with more data points, indicators, and interactive charts. 
The link to the Data Hub is provided in the event page and on data.worldbank.org, so feel free to explore its various indicators and interactive charts. Thank you so much. Will, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nada, for that great explanation, really clear and complete. And Nada, we'll stay on the panel to take questions. But first, we want to hear from the people most engaged in the policy work that these data are intended to inform. So the panel discussion will start with Maximo Torero. Maximo is the chief economist to the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN. And we're also privileged to have Yo Swinen, the global director for systems transformation of the CGIAR and the director general of the International Food Policy Research Institute. The two of them, Maximo and Yo, I think can speak better than anyone about the global public goods aspect of these data. And then we'll turn to national leaders from three countries that are very much on our minds, certainly on my mind. We're very fortunate to have with us Adeyinka Onabulu, Senior Advisor on Food Security and Nutrition in the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in the Government of Nigeria. We're also very fortunate to have Masresha Tesema, Director of Food Science and Nutrition Research in the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, part of the Government of Ethiopia. And, Extremely privileged to have Malinda Senevaratne, Director of Heartbeat, which is the Hector Kobikadua Agrarian Research and Training Institute, the National Research Service of the Government of Sri Lanka. All of our panelists are working at the forefront of some very fast moving changes. We're truly honored to have them with us here now. And thank you so much to each of the panelists for joining us. The panel discussion will be moderated by my colleague, Anna Herford co-director of the Food Prices for Nutrition Project. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Will. And I'm so delighted at this opportunity to bring together a very distinguished, and I think you will agree, a fascinating panel to discuss the use of these indicators at global and national levels. Before we launch into the panel discussion, I would like to remind everyone that you can share your thoughts and please submit your questions in the live chat in both English and French. Your questions that you enter will enter a moderation queue and will be assigned either by, uh, they will be answered either by our panelists during the Q&A or by our experts in the live chat in writing. So to begin our panel discussion, I'd like to start with a question from Maximo Torero, Chief Economist at FAO. Maximo, the Food Prices for Nutrition team has worked closely together with FAO as we've developed the indicators of the cost and affordability of a healthy diet. And we thank you for your leadership and your partnership in elevating this issue globally. Last week on July 6th, the flagship report, The State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World 2022 was launched with the theme, repurposing food and agricultural policies to make healthy diets more affordable. Why that theme? And what is FAO's vision for the use of these new diet cost indicators over the coming months and years? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the question and a real pleasure to be here. I'm so happy, Will and team, that things are moving forward with the bank and with IFPRI. Uh, so for the last three years, as you know, FAO brought the global attention to the fact that in countries both rich and poor, low disposable income relative to the high cost of nutritious food is one of the most serious impediments to accessing healthy diets around the world. And that's something extremely important because we not only report a chronic undernourishment, but we also report what is the fees, the food insecurity experience scale. And the fees measures both acute uh, severe food insecurity, which is related to, to the POU, to chronic undernourishment, and moderate food insecurity. So it measures undernutrition and overnutrition. So all forms of malnutrition and access to healthy diets is exactly the point that matters for, for that type of an indicator. So one of the key reasons why millions of people are food insecure and malnourished around the world is because healthy diets are out of reach and unaffordable. And diet quality is a critical link between food security and nutrition and poor diet quality can lead to different forms of malnutrition, including undernutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, overweight and obesity. And the latest numbers show how, again, overweight and obesity are starting to even go steeper and higher rate of velocity than a chronic undernourishment. 
we started this initiative uh, with staffs in 2020 when we published the first time the first edition of the SOFI report in which we start to publish these indicators and every year since then we have to keep updating these indicators because we believe it's something central it's something that brings additional information and important information for our member countries in our 2022 edition of the report which was launched last week uh, the latest, latest estimates shows that 3.1 billion people could not afford a healthy diet in 2020 this number has increased in 112 million and remember this is 2020 so still we are missing big part of COVID-19 and we are missing the exacerbation of the Ukraine war uh, just in chronic undernourishment the COVID-19 since 2019 the number increased in 115 more million people chronically undernourished so this number for sure will go up uh, next year because we are facing a problem of food access right now not yet a problem of food availability so given these problems and given the setbacks, I think uh, what we have to do is trying to find a solution to this problem. And normally when we touch this issue, the question is, okay, we need more resources no? uh, and we need more money to do things. So what we try to do in the SOFI report of 2022 is saying, okay, let's look at the money that we have assigned to agriculture, which the support of the agricultural sector is in average $630 billion a year, per year since 2013 to 2018, and see what, what, what is that money being used for. And what we found is that most of this money is being used for price incentives, subsidies, and many other mechanisms that create distortions uh, and create a problem to the affordability of healthy diets and also a problem to our environment. Many of those resources are showing that uh, they are supporting only staple commodities. So they are moving far away from what is the concept of a healthy diet. They are putting trade restrictions, trade barriers, uh, uh, subsidies which are completely inefficient. So the whole exercise that we try to do through simulation processes in this SOFI 2022, and it's a work that we keep need, need to do. In, I remember that we started, I did a, a first simulation long time ago in an APEC, I think 10 years ago, but now we have a lot more information to, to see what is the potential impacts. And, and what we found is that uh, there are ways in which we can have uh, an improving situation. Uh, price incentives, if they are realigned properly, could help to improve access to healthy diets without affecting too much producers and could improve and reduce the effects of greenhouse gas emissions. So price incentives could matter a lot. Uh, repurposing of production support directly could be more complicated, especially in poor countries, in developing countries, because the amount is not so big, so the impact could be diluted by inefficiencies in the way it is allocated. While price incentives can also go through the consumer side and create then the market-driven demand for the producers to re respond to that, cons that, that consumer demand. So a lot of work needs to be done uh, to continue this and to continue fine-tuning these findings and to try for, for ways in which we can understand the trade-offs of the repurposing of this, 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 uh, this support to agriculture, uh, to understand how it can be really allow us to achieve the goal of improving access to healthy diets, and at the same time minimize the effects over the environment and minimize the negative effects over the producers, because most a lot of this money go to, to, to producers. So that's where we are. Now, to the second part of your question, and I will be briefer, sorry about this, uh, Essentially, we want to continue doing this, and that's a, a given for us. For us, this is value information, uh, and we will continue working with you to, to, to make this more systematic. It's sad that we are still reporting 2020, and we're not reporting 2021 to be completely aligned to, to the SOFI reporting, and I hope in the future we can even report and project things in the future, because that, that's the aim, no? how we can have predictive power even in what we report. Today, we do some projections, but are mostly trend projections, and we need to change that. So we want to make this something uh, completely institutional in the sense that incorporate into the FAO stat. We still need to fine tune some issues, but the idea here is to be, that this data becomes part of the institutionalization of the FAO statistical work uh, so that we can have a system in place with your support and, and the work of the hub that can fit automatically and plug into all the, the SOFI reports in the future. Why is this so important? Because the SOFI reports, the data that comes out of the SOFI reports is reporting SDG indicators. And it goes automatically to all the UN reporting system and of course to the member countries. So it will be crucial importance uh, to continue working here and to continue expanding this also to the regional work at the country level and to try to find ways in which we can keep methodologically improving the indicator 
updating of all, of course, the whole time series, uh, but keep improving the indicator. There is a lot of work being done right now uh, between FAO, WHO, uh, UNICEF, uh, and other members of the of, of the UN Nutrition to try to also come up with a very clear definition of what a healthy diet is. No? Because that's still, there is a lot of ambiguity in that topic. And I think working together with you on that will help us to have very soon a very solid estimate, very transparent estimate with a very open methodology that we can constantly report in the SOFI as we do with other, other indicators. So with that, let me stop there and, and thank you again and a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Maximo. Thank you for these important reflections on the methodology, the data, and the gap between existing policies and what is needed. Uh, the advocacy of FAO is extremely important in repurposing policies to improve access to healthy diets. And as you noted, there's a need for additional data, which uh, Nada will speak to later in the, in the panel today. So uh, much to come, watch this space. Now I would like to turn to our second panelist, Adeyinka Onabolu, Senior Advisor on Food Security and Nutrition in the Nigeria Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Adeyinka, it's been really a pleasure to be in communication with you in some of the groundbreaking efforts that you're working on toward improved food security and nutrition in Nigeria. We know that Nigeria is currently integrating the cost and affordability of healthy diets indicators into monitoring systems at state level, including as part of the Nigeria Food Systems Dashboard, which was the main accountability mechanism proposed in the Food Systems Summit. So can you tell us why is subnational data on the cost of healthy diets so important for Nigeria? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Anna. I, I would like to say here that I'm employed by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, and I provide policy advisory support to the Federal Ministry of Agriculture. So we are very interested in um, having the cost and affordability of uh, nutritious diet or healthy diet into the dashboard because um, Nigeria is a very diverse country. We have 36 states and one federal capital territory. And um, when we have data, one point data for Nigeria, it doesn't give uh, a true picture of what is happening across all these states. For example, looking at the DHS data of 2018, the minimum dietary diversity range from 20% to 88% across the states. Underweight was amongst women range from 4% to 37% and overweight from 5 to 53%. And this tells us immediately that this, the states are not homogeneous, that the food environments are quite different across these states. And since we know that food prices are very important indicators of food access, uh, we, and also that it determines what people are able to eat, especially in the states where agriculture is not that, is not what majority of the people pra practice. So we decided that it was important to look at the cost of healthy diets across the states and have it as, a, as an indicator in the food systems dashboard because the food systems dashboard has information for each of the states and the federal capital territory. And it's also, it also has information disaggregated amongst the rural population and also the urban. So we are hoping that as we continue to uh, analyze data to report on this indicator, which we find as very important alongside the diet quality, because we're also looking at the indicator around diet quality. Uh, we are also looking at it because we don't have to set up another process for collecting food data, because the National Bureau of Statistics collects data on food prices monthly, they use it to report on the consumer price index. 
and we we realized that we can use that same data to call we have it is we have a mechanism whereby we can communicate the findings to the different governors note that in nigeria our governors are autonomous the states are autonomous at the federal level you can have policies you can have all those things but it's the governor that decides what is done in his or her state so we have a mechanism the nigeria governors forum the, the group, they've already mastered the art of providing information to policy makers where they don't need to write lengthy things. They use uh, um, traffic light uh, system to show the progress that they are making uh, for some indicators across the nutrition domain. Currently, they are focusing more on health indicators but we have been working with them over the past one year so that even from other sectors they can provide information to the governors like if one sees red and sees green for another state it, it makes them to start asking questions why does that person have green and i have red and that creates an opportunity to explain to them we're also hoping that since this indicator is going to be part of the subnational food systems dashboard. It will not be used in, in isolation. The governors can have information on, this is the situation in your state. These are the crops that you produce. These are the crops that we have used to calculate your costs. So these are the things that you can do to make sure that those food crops are more available and are cheaper in your state. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you so much, Ada Inka, for explaining how existing data can be used and no new data collection is needed and that the use of these data would really occur at the state level in Nigeria, considering even the ability for comparison across states and with other information such as the crop production you mentioned. So we really look forward to seeing the use of these indicators in informing policy dialogue towards improved food systems for nutrition. Thank you. I now will turn to Masresha Tasema, Director of Food Science and Nutrition Research in the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, EPHI. Thank you very much for joining today, Masresha, to tell us about this timely moment right now in Ethiopia for the use of these indicators. As we've discussed the cost and affordability of a healthy diet, these indicators measure access to food that meets dietary needs as defined by dietary guidelines. Ethiopia has just released its first set ever of national food-based dietary guidelines. Could you please tell us how these indicators relate to the implementation of the guidelines in Ethiopia? Thank you so much, Anna. Uh... Before I answer your question, and I would like to express that you know, the government of Ethiopia has a very clear and uh, coherent policy on nutrition, food, as well as the food uh, system. This has been uh, demonstrated with uh, recent food and nutrition policy strategy, as well as uh, Ethiopia has also developed the Ethiopian Food System Transformation Roadmap, which align also the global food or the UN food system uh, summit. So we also in that process identified uh, 22 game-changing solution. Among uh, those 22 game-changing solution, the food-based dietary guideline was identified as among the top priorities. So we are also part of the Healthy Diet Coalition. Ethiopia is one of the active member on the global level on the Healthy Diet Coalition. If you look at all those policies, strategies, and program, we are mainly centered into the healthy diet is the center of our activities. If uh, with this also, I would like to mention also the Ethiopian food-based food dietary guideline is the first evidence-based uh, guideline, which has also developed about 11 uh, message developed with uh, several research uh, finding and took over 
three years to develop uh, this. And coming to your question, Anna, you know, the cost of healthy diet especially could use us, you know, to monitor especially the, the food-based dietary guideline. It really, you know, this, you know, the tools come in the right times because we are at the verge of implementation of our guideline. So this could be used as in particularly to monitor our guideline implementation, especially we would like to monitor whether you know our population are receiving the healthy diet or not with uh, various social economic status. More importantly, you know, these tools could also be help us, you know, to decide evidence-based solution, especially for the policymaker, in order you know, to support the most vulnerable population, especially those who could not afford you know, the healthy diet. And with this, I think the policymaker could also make some adjustment or action to improve toward this uh, healthy diet. And uh, the other important things uh, or uh, point with uh, these tools is also, it helps us you know, to you know, see the accountability or to see the existing accountability with already you know, identified policies such as the food system uh, uh, transformation plan, as well as the food and nutrition strategy. So these are a general, you know, uh, overview to your question and I thank you and over to you, Anna. Thank you, Masrisha. It's really inspiring to hear about the pioneering use of food-based dietary guidelines in Ethiopia, not, not only as an educational tool, but also moving towards a tool for engaging um, across ministries on how to make recommended diets accessible. So thank you for joining and uh, I'll move to our next panelist, Johan Swinnen, who is the Director General of the CGR Systems Transformation Science Group and the Director General mm -hmm. of IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute. In these roles, we are very fortunate to hear from Johan about how these data and indicators relate to agendas in agricultural research and development. The CGR has traditionally focused on staple crops. The Food Prices for Nutrition Project, mainly through the cost of a healthy diet indicator, highlights the high cost of non-staple foods. How will the new one CGR help to address the high cost and unaffordability of diverse non-staples? Thank you, Anna. Thanks for the question and thanks for inviting me. I mean, needless to say, as one of the uh, one of the institutions involved in this new project. We are extremely happy that this is taking place to see this move forward. And we are also very excited about the potential that this project bring uh, as uh, already expressed by several other uh, colleagues on the panel here. Um, the one CGIR uh, going forward can and will play an important role in the area of, of nutrition going forward. It is true that traditionally, I mean, the, the image still exists that it's very much focused on, on, uh, on stable uh, crops and commodities and food. But I think there's also been an evolution over the past um, yeah, decades really on this. And particularly at IFPRI, I think we've done almost 40 years of, of a very strong focus on, on nutrition in our work there. And it is an essential and a core part of the one CGIR, the more broader one CGIR, CGIR research and innovation strategy for the next decade. Um, in, uh, for example, just to, to see a bit of the shift which has taken place over the past decades on this. And IPRI, of course, as I said, the research goes back a long way in collaboration with many partners, including Wageningen, for example, in the Netherlands, Stufts, the World Bank, our colleagues from FAO, which are here uh, on the call. And so at that, uh, research has contributed to the work on, uh, for example, the assessments of the Eat Lancet diet, uh, the, the unaffordability for so many people in the world uh, coming out of this research, the fact that it's a very expensive uh, set of uh, uh, food baskets, really. And as you, I mean, all the numbers here today, it's great to see the updates and, and the assessments there. And it's great for us, I think, to see that our, our work has contributed uh, to that. I think an important part is also that we have now increasingly are we trying to integrate uh, diet and nutrition indicators in our global and, and national models or economic models. And these were traditionally not there. I think it's really a great uh, contribution. Uh, 
uh, it's a contribution of the work that we do, but it's also a great uh, potential, I think, taking forward and becoming much more relevant in the food systems transformation um, uh, discussion and, and the public policy debate there for the reasons that, for example, Maxim was explained uh, very well. So we're, from that perspective, very excited about this project, as I mentioned already. I think it should be even more um, important, more impactful, if you want, given our um, new uh, 2030 once a year strategy, because there the focus is much stronger on broader strategy on diets and nutrition as it was before. For example, we have an, an impact platform, okay, which specifically focuses on nutrition, health, and food security. And the idea of the platform is really to organize ourselves so that the uh, Kind of for ensuring that the research portfolio as a whole, okay, has a sufficient attention for nutrition and dietary uh, issues, health issues. And of course, within the portfolio, there are a number of, of what we call them now initiatives, which are large research programs, which focus more explicitly on nutrition and uh, healthy diets. We have, for example, in one of these uh, large research programs called uh, Summarized by Shift, which is a sustainable healthy diets through food, systems, through food systems transformations, a bit of long term, um, which is very much focusing on the consumption side. We have another um, research initiative, which is focusing very much on fruit and vegetables, okay, which is uh, new, I think, with a very strong collaboration with the World Veg Institute uh, there, which is taking more end-to-end -end approach, both on, on the production side, the sub value chains and, and the consumption side. And then uh, increasingly, as I mentioned already, we are really trying to integrate much better um, diet indicators, uh, nutrition indicators in our, our country models, for example, our RIAPA models, but also our global and regional models, such as Migra, Mira Grodep and, and impact models, which we have in the past. I think there's been already several applications of that where we see results from this, for example, our, our estimates on how COVID-19 has affected uh, the nutrition situation in the world. Currently, we're doing a lot of, uh, we're intensively working on how the Ukraine conflict is affecting um, both, uh, basically broad global model simulations and, and national models, how it's affecting the nutrition and, and health situation in many countries. And I think also the work on repurposing of subsidies where Mark, where um, Maximo referred to has now by integrating the, the, the nutrition component there, it's, it's really much more powerful in, in think, talking about the impact on food systems as a whole. So all this work, I think, is going to benefit tremendously from this new project. So we are uh, we really are very strong uh, supporters of this work. And I hope also that our new CGIR research strategy with a much stronger nutrition and diet component will also allow actually have a bigger impact from, from the new uh, project and new data set. So we are, I can only say very positive things. I mean, I'm very excited about this. Thank you. Many thanks, Yo, for your insights. It's great to see so much work happening within the CGR to shift towards an even greater focus on healthy diets, including some of the new the new collaborations you mentioned on uh, supply side and demand side constraints, especially for fruits and vegetables, one of the most costly pieces of healthy diets. Uh, so thank you for your summary of these advances to come. And our final panelist is Malinda Seneviratne, Director of the Harti Agrarian Research and Training Institute in Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for being here, Melinda, given the late hour and the fast moving crisis happening in Sri Lanka. I'm sure there are lots of things occupying your attention at this time, yet you've still found the time and space for this topic today. So you have been a longtime journalist and writer and then last year, you became the director of the country's National Institute for Agricultural Statistics and Research. As a journalist, writer, and policymaker, how are the stories told about food security shaped by the statistics we measure? And what actions are implied at this time in Sri Lanka, considering the new indicator offered on the cost of a healthy diet? Right. Uh... Thank you, Anna, and thank you, everyone. Uh, now I was listening to Maximo, and uh, there are the key words, uh, tell the story, or in the case of Sri Lanka, the story that uh, ought to be written but has not been written. Because, uh, see, when we plan uh, our agriculture, we look at consumer demand. We don't necessarily look at the nutritional requirement. 
So what uh, what happens is that if you're repurposing it, uh, food, agriculture, dietary health, and affordability, then you are looking at a whole complex uh, scenario. Whereas uh, we have an institutional arrangement where health is somewhere else, agriculture is somewhere else, people are working in silos, and uh, there's really no healthy interaction and uh, exchange of information uh, and uh, collective decision making pertaining to the issues that uh, that are being addressed here. So uh, Melinda, the fixation is- Melinda, can I interrupt yeah. for a second just to- the interpreters are asking you to speak a little more clearly and slowly, maybe a little closer to the microphone. Okay, uh, am I clear now? I hope that that's better. But what I was trying to say is that there's a fix, fixation in agricultural policy on the on yield density, but uh, very little on uh, nutritional density. So the, that part of the story is actually missing. Now, Hathi uh, has been collecting uh, commodity prices, farm gate, uh, uh, retail, and, uh, and uh, wholesale prices of a whole bunch of commodities, more than 100 uh, for the last 35 years. But uh, we don't, we don't uh, match it with the nutritional attributes of each of these uh, commodities. We don't look at the cost of diets. We have, we have people working on that, but not, not in our institute, but somewhere else, because we are agriculture statistics is somewhere else. But right now, especially because we are in a crisis situation and affordability, uh, affordability is, uh, is going to be a very serious problem because of uh, unprecedented uh, inflation. Now, the positive side of the story is that you know, Sri Lanka is a tropical country with abundant natural resources, sunshine throughout the year, uh, enough uh, sufficient rainfall. But uh, at the same time, we have been blind or we have been, uh, we have been kind of uh, persuaded to be blind uh, to the resources that are around, around us. Uh, because when you talk about non-staples, uh, there's a lot that we actually grow. Uh, or grow wild in our home gardens. Uh, and uh, the joke or, or the kind of uh, anecdote is if you throw a stick, it will plant and it will bear fruit uh, and then it will bear some yield. So uh, it is necessary, uh, a policy shift is necessary. And for that policy shift, you need to get the data right now. If pre w uh, and the World Food uh, organization working closely we are working closely with these organizations to get the data right so that policy makers we are a policy advocacy institute so we can uh, give the policy makers and the ministers or, or the senior officials in the in these ministries the kind of information and thinking that is required for them to address the larger uh, issue in the end we have to eat healthy and everyone uh, must have you know, all, the, all the data that uh, is, uh, uh, it's very disturbing. And probably right now it is, the situation in Sri Lanka is uh, probably far more serious than the averages that, uh, that were presented here. So I think that uh, you know, it's a challenging situation, but just because we are in a crisis, that does not mean that we cannot get our act together. We cannot get the mechanism right to get the kind of information that is required to make this kind of uh, you know, repurposing of uh, policy in line with uh, what uh, you know, Maximo was uh, talking about. So I think that uh, it's a challenging time, but as uh, someone said, uh, <coughs> Churchill said that uh, even in a crisis, you can, it's a good time to do stuff. So we believe that uh, whether political situations and economic crisis, how bad or good those may be, the thinking and the research and uh, the formulation of strategies that need not take a backseat. In fact, that has to be in these kinds of situations, we need to rehearse the kind of methodologies uh, that will uh, stand the test of time and give the, the policy, which will yield the policy recommendations that can allow us to to formulate uh, a better kind of system to address the, the, the issues that, that concern, um, uh, concern us uh, at this point. Uh, so I think that would uh, kind of uh, put, it, put everything in a nutshell for now. Thank you. 
many thanks, thanks to you, Melinda, and we really appreciate your perspective uh, coming from this um, diverse tropical island where many things are produced and your unique lens on it, uh, especially given the many urgent priorities in Sri Lanka right now. So um, the fact that you have time today to discuss these issues on food security and nutrition is encouraging. Thank you. Now I'd like to bring in some of the questions that have come from the live chat. And the first question is for Maximo. The question from the live chat is, centralized food distribution globally heavily depends on a few grains. Most countries suffering from most of the food crises seem to be tropical nations where rich diversity exists for grains and tubers that can reduce the country's dependency on import and local um, means can provide more fresh and nutritious foods. What are the policy level changes thought about in countries or globally to encourage and promote local diverse food production and localized distribution related to what Malinda was just talking about? Thank you. An, an important question. I, I would like to, to argue three things. The first one is we should never move to the extremes, meaning moving to only local and not global or totally global. I think the combination of both is what makes the beauty of it and what allow us to, to assign our resources in the most appropriate way without losing our own capacities. And that's behind the importance of resilience and the, the behind the importance of having a diversity of food produced locally, but also at the same time having a diversity of sources from where you can import food when you need. One country doesn't have necessarily all the natural resources that are needed and all the seasons that are needed to produce all the diversity of food that you need. So it's very important not to lose both. You need to keep both and you need to accelerate both. Now, this, the, second, the second point, which, which is important also, also for us, is how we can increase uh, and gain efficiency of production in countries. Today, uh, the major challenge we face is that there are countries that are producing at very low levels relative to their potential of what they can produce. And that's linked to, to their diversity and their capacity to, to move forward. And one of the efforts we are doing through our hand in hand initiative exactly that is trying to target areas where there is agricultural potential so that we can uh, make these farmers and, and local producers to be able to achieve uh, their potential uh, in the short term and not necessarily waiting for decades. So, so that's something also extremely important uh, to look at and to take into consideration. And the third element is behavior. I think uh, in access to healthy diets, yes, is of course the cost and the affordability, but there is also the behavioral issue. I always remember the experience I have in Central America, where uh, you know in Central America uh, people consume tortillas, uh, and uh, USAID had this program of color tortillas. Basically, they were bringing vegetables and they were bringing other nutritious elements to the tortillas. Now, adults will never consume them because they will never change. Uh, they were inelastic to any change of the content of those tortillas. But kids can and young people can. And that's where behavioral change should happen. That's where more flexibility, more elasticity we have to be able to do that. So behavioral change is central uh, for us uh, to be able also to create this demand for more healthy diets and more, more healthy foods. The, the typical response we have today for high prices is I move to cheaper diets, which are low quality and so on. When could be that by changing my behavior of consumption, I can find cheaper diets, which are also still nutritious and which are also healthier that I can eat. So again, I think those three elements uh, are, are central. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maximo. Our next question is for Masrisha. So from another panelist, we heard about the need for state level data in Nigeria. And you mentioned the process of developing dietary guidelines for Ethiopia. Was affordability in different regions considered? And if so, what gaps and what subnational differences would you expect to see in Ethiopia that need to be addressed for all people to access the diets recommended? Yeah, thank you so much, Anna. 
Yeah, indeed, you know, Ethiopia is one of the very, you know, diverse country because, you know, we have, with the current, you know, government structure, we have uh, 13 uh, regional or sub-national uh, governments. Even under the same region or sub-national, we, uh, we will see a varieties of, you know, uh, diversities in terms of, you know, social economic status, dietary practice and so on. So we do expect that, you know, the affordability also may vary uh, by uh, different population group in different region. So that's also one of the consideration. And for your information, our uh, central statistics service or agency, they have, you know, the monthly, uh, the food price data was already been in the system has been collecting. We would like to use that system, the existing system to monitor, to monitor both national, uh, sub-national level uh, healthy diet uh, pattern, and that could be maybe a kind of bulletin or uh, dashboard. So we are under the process of discussion with CSA and other responsible government organization to see the real difference. But in terms of you know the guideline, the guideline has a clear message that will also address mostly uh, all, I can say all regional uh, food consumption, pattern as well as the diversity. So in terms of affordability there, yes, there is a clear, you know, gap in terms of, you know, the regions and that would also, uh, most of them would be addressing the implementation. I thank you over to you, Anna. Thank you so much, Masrisha. Our next question from the live chat is for Adayinka. The question is, the cost of healthy diets not only differs by country or by region, but also can differ from season to season. So is seasonality factored into the analysis and how? Yeah, thank you. I will leave my video off because the network bandwidth is very low. Uh, you will recall that I said that um, we are going to be computing this on a monthly basis because the full prices are available on a monthly basis. And this presupposes that we will capture the different seasons that we have. And in Nigeria, we only have two main seasons. That's the rainy season and the dry season. And usually things are very critical just before the onset of the rains. And also, because it's going to be on a monthly basis, it's even going to capture uh, changes, even when the seasons are not changing that drastically. It's going to capture when the harvest is being depleted bit by bit. It will capture if there is uh, heightened security issues in some places. And that's why one of the things that we hope we'll be able to do as we collect this data on a monthly basis and uh, put it on the dashboard is that we can also diagnose on a monthly basis how food access and affordability may be a barrier to the consumption of a healthy diet and also of a diverse diet. And we can also identify gaps in food supply chains that can be leveraged upon to reduce the cost of healthy diets. So the way we are doing it, since the data is going to be available on a monthly basis, we can monitor even the slightest of changes as the month rolls on to the month over. Thank you. Thank you, Adayinka. Excellent. And great to hear that uh, clarification on how the data can be used. The next question from the live chat is for Malinda. How do you deal with rapidly, rapidly changing prices in a high inflation situation? <laughs> well, uh, if you're asking me as a person, as an individual, as a citizen, I adapt. Uh, you know, I kind of change my consumption pattern and that is something that uh, everyone has had to do. What we are seeing over the last several months because the crisis was uh, obvious and uh, there were a lot of uh, predictions about, uh, you know, 
there's going to be a famine and things like that. So but people started growing food. Everyone is growing food. Every hospital, every army camp, every village, every temple, every household, people are, are growing uh, food. I mean, a crisis situation, what else? You don't know where the next, uh, when the next shipment of uh, fuel is going to come. You know, you don't know when the next shipment of fertilizer is going to come. So you grow, if you can't, if you don't have uh, diesel to uh, you know work the, the the paddy fields to plow but you don't have uh, fertilizer uh, for rice uh, you you grow things which will give you certain kinds of nutritional and to supplement the complement that you have so that is that is uh, what you what you really have to do and uh, that is what everyone everyone is uh, experiencing this as an individual, as a household, as a community. And in many places, like in the village that I live in, uh, we have decided that we will not let any, any child in our uh, village uh, go without food. You know, the, he or she will have three meals a day. And there's enough food. It's just a question of uh, distributions because it's political economy and there's an entitlement issue and you've got to address that politically, collectively as a community and that kind of thing um, we have to do with long term of course you need to change food habits you have to think about you know uh, if you're talking about fortified uh, you know, rice you've got to think uh, understand that traditional varieties are more nutritious there's data and if you want to fortify anything that's what you've got to work on so but uh, you know coming back to the question right now it is in crisis the political establishment is in crisis the citizens are as a collective uh, in a crisis, uh, as individuals, households, and communities, we, we have to, uh, uh, it's best to assume that no one is going to help us. That is best, I think, pragmatic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, next question, which was previously submitted is, uh, for Johan. The cost of a healthy diet is based on the cost of food in markets. However, many people source food from their own production or wild collection. So if diets are unaffordable in the market, how do non-market food sources relate to the agenda of improving access to healthy diets? Uh, thanks very much. Well, it's a <clears throat> it's it's a very good question, right? And so there's a if you want a, 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 a theoretical or, or conceptual side to the question uh, and an empirical one, right? And so the the conceptual one is well, <clears throat> if you are producing food at home, you harvest it, right? Then essentially you have the choice: you can go to the market and sell it there, or you can consume it yourself. So in a, even if in a way, you're not selling the product to yourself. You are implicitly selling the product to yourself. So you can value that based on the data that we have. So everything in that conceptual framework, everything has a price there. I think on some of the empirically, then on on, a bit, on some of the other indicators, we may have much less good price indicators. For example, collection of uh, some foods in in uh, in other environments, etc. So. And having good indicator to measure that, I think, is a problem. But at least conceptually, it's possible to deal with that. Thank you very much for that uh, answer and the, the clarification there. Um, we have a few more previously submitted questions. And um, one of these questions is data for regions like Sub-Saharan Africa is really striking. Does the data collected allow us to understand whether this is mainly driven by demand, such as incomes are too low, or by supply, such as pr food products are too expensive due to the lack of economy of skills in the agro food sector? So I leave this open to the panelists uh, who has something that they'd like to contribute on this. 
um, about Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, supply or demand factors. Perhaps, Ada Inka, do you have some insights from your experience from at least one Sub-Saharan African country? Uh, thank you. I am not an economist, but from where I sit, what I can say is that at times the foods are available, people are unable to buy. At times the crops are produced, but post harvest losses reduce the amount that is available for people to buy. And um, also, I also think that uh, because generally in the developed world, it's believed that poverty actually resides with us in Africa. So purchasing power is also another issue. And because many people, all these migration to the urban areas also makes it impossible for people to, to to grow something small to be able to supplement what they can buy. So not being able to get to buy enough to eat, I think has so many factors speaking to eat in Africa. So that's what I can say. Thank you. And perhaps uh, Masrisha, do you have other insights from the East African perspective? Yeah, thank you. Just to, to complement what has been already said by Adinka. So I think most importantly in many uh, Eastern Africa, what we should do is I think one of the issues is especially we need to have increase the production, including the production diversity. That's the most important thing because most of the land, there has been some evidence that most of the land in Africa has not been still cultivated. So we need to have a mechanism that you know, our subsistence farmer has to use some technology to increase the production diversity, production increment. That's the most important. And the second one, as I've been said, you know, in many Eastern Africa, the post-harvest loss is very high. So we need to also consider, you know, uh, the post-harvest loss reduction should be in the agricultural policy as well as in the food system policy in order to increase the, the production side as well as uh, especially the supply side. And the other important issue that has been raised from the demand side, you know, income purchasing power has also been related to the economic development poverty. And this has also been not forgotten because we need to have also a mechanism to reduce poverty as well as increase, especially the economic status of those, you know, the most vulnerable groups and these are the most important things uh, with, uh, from my perspective. And thank you, Anna, over to you. Thanks so much for that perspective, Masrisha. Hey, Johan, over to you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a point here on um, what we've learned through COVID and, and, uh, and now with the, the, how the Ukraine crisis is affecting global food security. I mean, if you look at, if you're in a static situation, right, you can basically uh, increase, ac increase access to food either by lowering the cost of food or the diet or by increasing the income of people. And so in that way, one always has to look at the amount and supply in an integrated fashion. I think we should not, not separate these out, but of course the solution of, of, of proposals for solving the problem should work both or should and could work both on the supply side and the demand side. What we've learned, oh, but I think from a resilience perspective, okay, and so if we look back over the over food prices the last 25 decades, uh, not 25 decades, 25 years, when we talk about what happened in 2008 it was a food price shock, and shock means you deviate unexpectedly from the normality, which was supposed to be stability, okay? If you look back over the last 20 years now on price data, the norm is instability, okay? It's been extremely volatile, the global food markets, or fertilizer and oil as well. And so that means I think we have to start looking at these things from much more from a resilience perspective than rather from a stability, from a stable environment perspective, I think as well. And that should inform our food policy. And if you see, for example, COVID-19, initially we thought 
that the supply chain disruptions would be the, a really big factor in, in affecting people's access to food. It turns out that the demand side was much more important. I mean, the loss in jobs, the loss in incomes has turned out to be a much more important factor than uh, than the supply side disruptions. And I think that's really important. Right now, the Ukraine crisis is it's a different type of crisis, and of course, it's, different supply chains are affected differently as well. Okay, but similar things may come out of that. Okay, and that's important, of course, when going back to the project we're talking about today, uh, is about um, so how when we get good information on these price data, okay, where do they relate to, et cetera. And I think, again, the type of project we have here is going to provide a wealth of information which we did not have before. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Art Cray for the panel. Thanks, Anna. I, I hope I'm not break, breaking protocol by jumping into the discussion here. But as I was listening, something occurred to me that strikes me as um, worth thinking about when we think about how to use this data to inform policy decisions, which many of the panelists have spoken about. And the scenario that I'm wondering about is the following. You know, suppose we have a government that has you know, a pretty extensive food subsidy program in place. Now, presumably, the effects of those subsidies on lower food prices are going to be captured by these, um, you know, cost of a healthy diet calculations. But we also advocate that countries should, you know, get rid of food subsidies in favor of more targeted uh, programs. And the question is, you know, will good policy show up in the data if we do this? Because the other side of the coin is that you know most of the household surveys that we have in most low-income countries actually only measure consumption. We don't have direct measurements of income. So to the extent that we have a targeted subsidy program that is increasing households' purchasing power to, to buy food at the higher prices without the subsidies, we wouldn't actually be able to capture it in the, the, the affordability calculations. So it'd be great if any of the panelists have thoughts on, on well, whether this is a concern and and how we might address it. Thanks so much for that question, Art. And uh, I would open the panel, the floor to anyone on the panel who'd like to respond. And I think your your biggest expert here is Will. Okay, he's not formally on the panel, but he's on the screens here, so maybe he may want to comment. But I think it's it's a very good point. You know, trade plays a very important role in this as well, right? If you have open trade in principle and you're a small country, then uh, your food subsidies should not uh, affect the price in the market for it because the price will be, I mean, again, conceptually, okay? Because the prices will be determined by the global markets in this case, whether or not you give subsidies. But of course, the, uh, your, the real price that consumers pay will be affected because that's where the subsidy uh, component comes in. So it's, it's always an, an, a very difficult issue. You need a, the right conceptual framework and, and model to use to interpret the data that you observe, I think. But I'm sure Will has great insights to add to that. Thanks a uh, lot. And yes, the floor is open to Will also. Please go ahead. Yes, and I just want to emphasize the, the value here in answering Art's question of looking across the entire diet. Because when we do that, what we see is the message of the SOPI 2020, that the existing subsidy programs targeted to lower prices for the staple foods are important in the diet. In healthy diet costs, it matters to have low cost wheat or low cost rice, but it doesn't matter that much because the expensive things that we're picking up here are the final retail service provision, the distribution costs uh, of these nutritious food groups that have been too often neglected in the infrastructure and in the institutions that would support low cost value chains. Uh, and that the agenda of one CGIR that Yo discussed, that the national programs that the Inca mentioned, that Thresha mentioned, you know, where this is a, a big unfulfilled agenda uh, for the rest of the diet cost. So it definitely, the story you told is definitely important on the starchy staples and matters, uh, but it's only a small part of the story of an overall healthy diet. Thanks a lot, uh, Will, and thanks Art for that final question for the panel. 
And as uh, Nada is here as well uh, to be a part of the panel, I have a final question for you, Nada. Um, this is about the ICP global data set, which has enabled the analysis of food prices for nutrition globally. However, the ICP data are currently available only once every few years. And as we've seen over the last months and years, prices can change a lot in the interim. So what are the next steps that you would like to see to increase the coverage and the frequency of food price data to monitor the cost of a healthy diet? Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, and indeed, to set up a global system to inform government policy and programs, what we would need is regular high frequency and granular data on food prices. And high frequency food price data is being collected, has been collected for years in almost every country, but it has not been effectively harnessed for a global monitoring system. So as part of inflation monitoring, almost every country collects high frequency prices of food items that are representative of their national consumption patterns. And because food commands a significant portion of expenditures, food price monitoring is built into the exercise that we all know, which is the consumer price index, the CPI. And the food CPI is also regularly reported. Now these data are official, are produced, are collected by countries, and that is a major advantage over data that are collected through parallel efforts. And that lever and these data basically would leverage the existing investment of each country in data collection. So in a nutshell, these data exist. They are there. They have been collected. They are in uh, national statistical offices across all countries. And I think what we would need here is a global partnership, a new global partnership between the countries, international agencies such as FAO, the WFP, the World Bank, and academic and research centers such as Tufts and IFPRI that are here today. And that partnership would bring together all these multiple resources and multiple systems already in place at national and global level. And in my view, this partnership would leverage the wealth of food price data that already exists and build a global food price monitoring system that would allow us to routinely track the cost and affordability of a healthy diet as a central component of food security. And I want to also add a point I think that uh, Maximo um, mentioned earlier. There's still a lot of room to improve data sources. There's still a lot of room as well to work on methodology and to improve methodology. So the work has just started and this global partnership, new global par partnership can take on uh, much of the research, the methodological and the data sources that are needed for this work. Thank you. Back to you, Anna. Thanks a lot, Nada. Yes, it's really exciting to be partnering together and look towards this future agenda with a lot more that can be done uh, using uh, other national sources of data and complementing what we do already have and engaging with countries around the world. So thank you for that. And uh, thank you all for the rich discussion. It's really been fascinating to explore the topic from your distinct perspective. So thanks uh, to Maximo, to Adyinka, Masresha, Yo, and Malinda, and also to Art and Will and Nada for your contributions as well. We are getting towards the end of today's event. And with that, let me give the floor to Enoch Chikava, who is the Interim Director of Agricultural Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for his closing remarks. Enoch, over to you. No, thank you so much. I uh, thoroughly followed the debate and enjoyed it a lot. So again, just uh, reiterating the thanks uh, to our distinguished uh, panelists. But again, this conversation uh, could not be at a more timely opportunity. As we all know, uh, we are in the middle of this world food crisis. But today there is at least a new sense of agency that we need to act. You know, for some of the organizations, as again, if we say 40 years looking at this and the World Bank, but maybe the timing is so crucial now that there's that sense for us to want to do something about it. Not just with short-term aid, but 
also with long-term investments. But to be effective, we need to understand more about the nature of the problem. And that's why so many of us who work in the food systems and agricultural development sector, uh, we are very grateful to the World Bank, uh, Tufts University, IFPRI and FAO, uh, that they've come together to create the food prices for nutrition project. Thanks to this work, uh, we now have access to standardized metrics for measuring the cost and affordability of the healthy diets. And it's good to hear that countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka are starting to use these metrics to inform policy decisions. And it is true that what's get, what gets measured gets done. We have seen that over and over in the work that we do. Your contributions to the SOFI report have been especially very helpful. Uh, understanding that today, almost a third of the world, more than 3 billion people, cannot afford to eat a healthy diet captures the true scope of the food challenges that we face. It's also good to see that even more data is coming. There's the new toolkit uh, to help policymakers calculate the cost of a healthy diet and also the new food prices for nutrition data hub. The lack of data to inform the effective policy is a major reason there is a big disconnect today between the food related investments and the impact that we want or the impact that we seek. The self report did not notes that um, every year governments across the world invest 630 billion, I was looking at this number uh, very closely, uh, in food and agriculture initiatives. But every year, more and more people cannot afford a healthy diet. And I think the key reason here is these investments are not reaching farmers, especially smallholder farmers. If you look at the regions where people travel the most to purchase healthy diet, they are often places where smallholder farming provides most of the food sold in the local markets and most of the uh, income people need to purchase healthy diets. Many of these farmers are women who lack equal access to the same productive resources as men. If we want to improve access to healthy diets, then we need to support smallholder farmers and especially women farmers with policies, tools, strategies that help them sustainably increase production of a wide range of healthy foods. Improving access to healthy diets also requires significant new investments in agricultural adaptation. Food security is deteriorating in regions like uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia because smallholder farmers are being overwhelmed by climate stresses. The series of droughts threatening millions of people in the Horn of Africa today are unprecedented. Yet according to this year's SOFI report, only 1.7% of the climate finance, which is in the north of over $500 billion globally, is reaching small-scale producers. And most of that is focused upon mitigation and not adaptation. That's why we must ensure the issues that we discussed today are front and center at the COP27 climate summit in Egypt. Some call it the African COP. We are living in the midst of a very difficult period. However, I'm encouraged by the many exciting new ideas and insights that we have discussed today. Also at the global level, we have seen the G7 and the World Bank respond to the ongoing food crisis by creating the Global Alliance for Food Security. The Alliance can accelerate emergency assistance to hard hit regions and generate the political support for long-term investments that will be crucial for increasing access to affordable healthy diets. And, and lastly here, you know, access to affordable healthy food should not be a fundamental, it, it is, should be a fundamental human right and not a luxury. Uh, the food prices for nutrition project is providing a major contribution 
uh, towards achieving goal. So thank you so much. Uh, it's been a great honor for me to be here. And thank you, Enoch, for that uh, sobering but, but inspiring conclusion. So on behalf of the entire project team, I want to express my gratitude again to the Gates Foundation, the UK government, FAO for leadership and funding this work, uh, to World Bank and IFPRI for partnership on the project, to the World Bank team for hosting today, and for all of you for joining us uh, in this very important conversation. All around the world, a deep thank you, especially uh, Mashresh in Ethiopia, the Inca in Nigeria, uh, and Malinda in Sri Lanka, thanks so much again for joining us today. Uh, so for our online audience, as I mentioned, we'll have a follow-on conversation tomorrow, the same time hosted by IFPRI, more technical discussion with project researchers. Uh, but most importantly for all of you, I think many, many opportunities for us to work together on these vital issues uh, in the months and years ahead. So thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, again, the recording will be available on this site. You can share with others. Thank you. Thank you.